right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna be brewing an absolute spring and summer classic beer, an American Pale Ale. The American Pale Ale, or APA, is pretty much like a little brother to the American IPA. Uh, ends up being a little bit less hoppy and a little bit less strong. You're typically gonna see like a four to 6% ABV and like a 35, I wanna say, to like 50-ish IBU count. American Pale Ales really are one of my favorite styles and they're not too hard to make. In my opinion, I think the American Pale Ale is probably one of the best spring and summer beers out there just because it is so drinkable. Uh, it's a super balanced beer, very light on the palate, very low in ABV. Uh, relative to other American beers. And it has enough hop expression to really kind of keep things interesting. And, and you can really kind of play around with some of the more delicate hop notes in there. Um, however, what it is not is an IPA. And that's something that I think everybody needs to keep in mind when they're brewing their pale ales, because it's very, very easy just to go a little bit overboard on these hops and turn it into an IPA. Uh, and that's not what we're doing here today. Above anything else, this beer must be balanced. It needs to have a nice, tasty, clean malt character to it, and it still has to have enough hop character to be noticeable and interesting, and, um, you know, really complement things and set it apart from something like a blonde ale. Uh, but still not so much of the degree that it turns into an IPA and all you're tasting are hops. The bitterness needs to be kept in check as well as the residual amount of like citrusy craziness that you can get from late boil hops. Um, we are going to kind of trend this brew today towards a slightly hoppier variant of an APA, but it's still not going to be quite to the level of an IPA. So the recipe I came up with today is kind of modeled after a uh, fantastic American Pale Ale that I had a couple months ago uh, at Moat Mountain Brewery and Smokehouse in North Conway, New Hampshire. They make a pale ale called Iron Mike that is uh, pretty easy to find in the New Hampshire area. So if you're local to that area, I do recommend checking it out. It's a pretty good beer. I picked this one because it's really good, first of all, but also their, their website basically lists a bunch of the ingredients involved. And I thought it'd be kind of a fun challenge to see if, what I could do with that to try and replicate the style. So this is what their website says. Iron Mike is an American style pale ale with ABV of 5.6 and IBUs of 45. And it says our original hoppy ale has a medium bitterness and crisp dry mouthfeel. The ale has flavors of toasted grain, floral hops, and hints of orange peel and grapefruit. Iron Mike is double dry hopped to finish clean with bright West Coast hop aromas. Yeah, style is American Pale Ale. Color is hazy summer afternoon. Malt is Bavarian Pilsner Malt and Munich. Hops are Chinook, Cascade, and Centennial, and yeast is American Ale. So that's a lot of information if you're trying to clone a beer. So I figured I'd take that information and build a recipe similar to it and see what we can get. So this is the recipe that I came up with to try and mimic this particular beer. Um, starting out with 10 pounds of German Pilsner. Now if you're brewing any old American Pale Ale, you can use other base malts. Pretty much any base malt you pick is probably going to be fine. Um, but I would probably recommend Golden Promise or Pearl Malt above any of the others. Next, we're going to add one pound of Munich malt, and that's going to be the Munich Type 1, which is the lighter variant of Munich malt. And then on top of that, I'm going to add half a pound of flaked wheat. Now, the flaked wheat's not called for on the website at all, but I think adding that is really going to boost the head retention, um, and it's going to make the, the head a bit fluffier. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, it might actually add a flavor contribution as well. I might be able to pick that up since it's pale ale. Um, and now hops. The hop schedule on this one's going to be a little bit more complicated. So um, I don't necessarily know if they add Chinook versus Cascade and Centennial at various points in varying amounts. Uh, so we're just going to do all three of them in equal quantities for every single hop edition here, just to kind of blend them all together. Uh, there may be a better way of doing this, but that's what I decided to do. Chinook and Centennial are both rather high alpha hops, so make sure that when you're adding your hops to your American Pale Ale, like I said, don't add so much that it becomes an IPA. It's very easy to let the uh, IBUs and the bitterness get ahead of you when you're designing your recipe. So we're gonna do a 60 minute boil and I'm only going to use a quarter ounce of Chinook at 60 minutes to bitter, which will give us about 10 IBUs. 
At 30 minutes, I'm going to add a quarter ounce each of Cascade and Centennial. And that should bring us up to like 23-ish IBUs. And then about 10 minutes from the end, I'm going to add a quarter ounce each of Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook. And then at knockout or at zero minutes, uh, we're going to add another quarter ounce each of Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook. And that brings us up to our target of 44 or 45 IBUs. Uh, now it's specified that it's also double dry hop, so we're going to do two dry hopping additions. So our first dry hop is going to be a half ounce each of Cascade, Chinook, and Centennial. And that's going to probably be a couple days into fermentation, relatively early. And then my second dry hop is going to be a full ounce each of Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook. Uh, and that's going to be right as fermentation is coming to an end. I'm going to try and move the fermentation along quickly so that I don't end up uh, keeping the dry hops in there for too long. I really don't want to have grassy flavors come out of this. For our yeast, it specifies American Ale yeast, which to me, I think the easiest and most straightforward one is probably going to be using US05. That's the Chico strain, so the same strain as Y yeast 1056. You can also use Imperial's flagship strain or WLP001 from White Labs. For the water profile, for the most part, it's not going to be too minerally. I'm going to have higher levels of calcium and a ratio of about 3 to 1 for the sulfate to chloride ratio. So the water profile I'm going to be using is 80 parts per million of calcium, 6 parts per million of magnesium, 9 parts per million of sodium, 47 parts per million of chloride, 154 parts per million of sulfate, and 23 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with 8 gallons of distilled water, so you should be able to copy this water profile if you're using distilled water or RO water for your own beers. And to that, we're going to be adding 7 grams of gypsum, 2 grams of epsom, 3 grams of calcium chloride, and 1 gram of baking soda. And that should hopefully get us uh, a great tasting, slightly hop forward beer with a mash pH, hopefully, of about 5.4. So for the mash in this one, nothing too complicated. We're just going to go straight down the middle of the road in terms of mash temperatures. One single infusion mash at 152 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes should get us exactly where we need to be. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached the required temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps in the mash as usual. Next, I started the recirculation. 10 minutes in, I recorded a mash pH of 5.36, which was uh, very close to the predicted 5.4 that uh, Brewer's friend had given me. After this, I let the mash sit for 90 minutes at 152 degrees. Once the mash had completed, I set the temperature on the controller to 170 degrees for the mash out. The mash out step denatures all enzymes in the mash and helps the wort drain through the grain bed a bit easier. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and I let that drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that, I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for a pre-boil gravity reading, and I recorded a measurement of 12 and a half bricks, or 1049. This was two points higher than my predicted pre-boil gravity, which was a really good sign. Once I reached the boil, I added my first hop addition, which was just a quarter ounce of Chinook. Then I let the boil continue for another 30 minutes before coming back to add my 30 minute hop addition, a quarter ounce each of Cascade and Centennial. I came back 20 minutes later for the 10 minute hop addition, a quarter ounce each of Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook. I also added a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient at this time. Also around 10 minutes, I started recirculating boiling wort through my chiller to sanitize it. This is probably the easiest way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment no matter what you have. After about 10 more minutes had elapsed, I added my zero minute knockout addition of hops and that was a quarter ounce each of Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook. I ended the boil, I took the whole setup inside where I could hook my chiller up to the sink and then I began chilling. I let the wort chill down to about 65 degrees Fahrenheit and then I pitched my yeast. I aerated the wort with pure O2 with a dose of about one minute at full blast. I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of 13 bricks, 
which was pleasantly about 1051, only two points lower than what Beersmith had actually predicted. So all in all, a very good brew day. For fermentation of the beer, it's gonna be relatively simple and straightforward, I think. Um, it is not a very complicated fermentation, and as far as yeasts go, USO5 is probably one of the most forgiving yeasts out there in terms of temperature. USO5 tends to have a pretty solid fermentation anywhere from about 55 up to about 72. Anywhere above 70 is probably gonna push a lot more of a fruity ester, uh, which I don't personally want in this beer, but if that's a desired characteristic for you, then more power to you. But it's got a very wide temperature range, and I've heard of people fermenting all the way down to 55 with it. Uh, the cooler you ferment it, the more clean it's going to end up being. So in my case, I want a clean beer. I don't want the pale ale to have any sort of competing fruit flavors from the yeast. Uh, I want the hot flavors to be exhibited and shine and be nice and delicate and not have any sort of additional esters get in the way and muddle things up. So I'm going to go kind of on the medium cold side. We're going to go for about 64 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for a fermentation temperature, and that should produce a pretty clean beer. Now, because of the cooler temperature, it's not going to be the world's fastest fermentation. Um, and it may not attenuate fully before it drops out and that's okay I mean if it gets down to like 10 12 to 10 13 I'm gonna be fine with that uh, the mash temperature I picked I'll probably be expecting a final gravity anywhere between 10 09 and 10 13 um, and I'm okay with any of those really so the higher the final gravity the better though because that's gonna help aid and balance I think in terms of this beer uh, you want a little bit of sweetness there to kind of counteract uh, some of the bitterness you're going to get from the hops and that's kind of amplified by the water profile as well. Uh, I don't expect fermentation time to be more than like 10 to 12 days. Uh, so we're going to try and figure out how to uh, incorporate the dry hop into that because I don't want dry hop sitting in my beer for more than really six days um, because you could start to risk having some of those off flavors associated with large amounts of hop material in the just floating freely in the beer. What I think I'm probably going to do is have my first dry hop about five days into fermentation and then my second dry hop will be three or four days after that depending on how fermentation is going. I really do kind of want to minimize the amount of contact time that the dry hops have with the uh, with beer. Um, and that is especially important for that first dry hopping edition because it will sit in there for like three or four days longer than the, the uh, second one. So in a nutshell, I'm going to be fermenting this one at about 64 degrees, no ramp up temperature or anything like that, for about 10 to 12 days, I think. And uh, I'll be dry hopping probably on day five and then maybe on day eight or nine, uh, depending on how the fermentation is going. So ever since I got this fermenter, folks have been asking me how am I planning on dry hopping with it. So I'm going to demonstrate in this video with the first of two dry hopping uh, sessions. And while I could just open up the top lid here and just drop the hops in, um, and it is early fermentation, that actually probably would be fine. It wouldn't introduce any additional oxygen. Uh, I am going to show you a method here that is oxygen free. Um, and this is commonly used by a lot of people with these conical type fermenters. Uh, and it's actually relatively easy to set up. So let's get into it. So on the Spike CF5, there's an additional one and a half inch tri clamp port right here, which um, I normally will hook up with the uh, blow off tube, or as you can see here, an airlock. However, what I've done this time is add an additional uh, butterfly valve here. Now, right now, the butterfly valve is open and I have an airlock in here. However, we're gonna oxygen free dry hop. So first thing I'm gonna do is close off the butterfly valve. Take out our airlock, sanitize everything. That includes your gasket, and then you're going to want a one and a half inch tri clamp sight glass or tube works as well. And now we're going to go ahead and add our dry hopping addition here. This is half an ounce each of Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook. Now, the one and a half inch sight glass like this, the opening is a bit narrow. Uh, some people will use a three inch uh, sight glass or two inch, something larger, and then have an adapter to fit that to whatever they need to. Um, I don't happen to have that set up right now, so if I just went ahead and tried to put them in here, it'd be a little difficult. So we're gonna add them to one of the hot packages that it came in, and then use that to go into the sight glass. So next you're gonna need another sanitized dry clamp here. And you're also gonna need this, either a gas manifold or some other tri-clamp addition where you have both a pressure relief valve for no more than 15 PSI, because that's really kind of testing the strength on this, um, and a gas post or some way to add pressure. And now I'm just gonna grab a gas line out of my kegerator and I've made sure to set my cylinder pressure to only about five PSI here and we'll pressurize. 
All right, so as you can see, we got some pressure in here. Now we'll start purging CO2 from the cylinder. And then once you're satisfied that you've got enough oxygen out of the uh, little side glass attachment there, give it one more shot of pressure. And then open up your butterfly valve. Two. And it might need a little jostling around to actually get them through this one and a half inch port. So at this point, now you're completed your dry hop, all you have to do is close your butterfly valve again. And you can either take this off and put an airlock back on, um, or you can leave it in place and put a spunning valve on if you want to pressure ferment from this point out. Um, but that's really all there is to it. It's a little janky with the uh, one and a half inch. I probably should be using a bigger side glass if I want to do this method. Uh, this is the first time I've tried this, but uh, I think it works overall pretty well as an oxygen free way of dry hopping. Final gravity's coming in at about 10.07. Uh, so that's actually a little drier than we expected, but uh, all in all, not too bad. All right, so here we are. Now it's, uh, it's actually been a minute since I kegged this, but I actually did ferment this out very quickly. Um, I was able to hit my final gravity in about seven days, and then basically that really helped me in minimizing the amount of contact time that there was for those dry hops. And effectively that way I didn't have too much long-term exposure of the dry hops to the wort, and that kind of helped cut down on a lot of the grassy flavors that you might get from otherwise heavy dry hopping additions. However, because I did loose dry hop in the fermenter, as you saw, we did have some issues getting the, uh, the beer to transfer properly through a poppet valve into the keg itself. Um, I had to clear a couple clogs during that entire process and it was kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, I'm gonna have to figure out a better system than just trying to force it through a closed transfer into the keg. At the end of the day though, I don't think we really had any issues in terms of uh, oxidizing the beer or infecting the beer or anything like that. So I think everything was fine. Um, however, it was just a big pain in the butt. But all in all, I'm very happy with the way the beer turned out. It's a pretty tasty, somewhat hazy uh, American Pale Ale. So let's go ahead and get to pouring this thing, shall we? All right, so the beer is called I Hate CrossFit, and that's definitely in reference to the Iron Mike exercise. Uh, and it comes in at 5.8% ABV and 45 IBUs, which is not that far off of our target of 5.6% ABV and 45 IBUs. So not too bad there. All right, so for appearance of the beer, it pours a really nice kind of mild, lighter gold color, um, and it has a, a very white head with some nice structure, and uh, it does stick around for a little while, which is good. I am very happy to see that. However, I will make one note on the appearance of the beer, and that is uh, this is actually not gonna stay hazy forever. Um, so I actually had this beer uh, sitting in the keg for the last like 10 days and it actually dropped clear. Now I had an issue with my floating dip tubes that I use typically to, uh, to serve beer out of for my kegs and I had to actually kind of like shake the keg up a little bit to get liquid back into the dip tube so that it would continue to pour beer and not just spit out foam. Um, and as a result, I ended up actually kicking a lot of the haze back into solution. Uh, so it's not actually gonna look like this normally. It will drop clear after a little while. So if you are brewing this recipe and you're looking for a hazy pale ale, this may not be the way to go. However, um, if you do want something like that, I would look into adding a little bit of protein into the grist. So something more like uh, some flaked wheat or flaked oats, maybe, probably about 10%. Uh, and that will get you a decent haze as long as you dry hop properly and then add some you know, some biotransforming yeast on top of that might do it for you as well. Anyway, I digress, we're gonna go into aroma. So the aroma on this beer is actually pretty awesome. Um, because of that double dry hop, we have a lot of extra aroma. Uh, it is a very, very aromatic beer, um, and it hit, kinda hits you first and foremost with a very strong dank note. This beer is just very pungent. It's, uh, it's very, 
very, um, well, it's dank. It's very much, it just smells like weed, man. Uh, you get a little bit of like a, kind of an almost tropical grapefruit on there. Um, I wouldn't go so far as, as to describe it as a tropical fruit, but it is definitely grapefruity. All right, now we're gonna go in for mouthfeel in our first swig. So the mouthfeel on this one's actually pretty light. Um, it did finish pretty dry, so it doesn't have that much body. And I didn't really add any sort of protein or extra stuff in there to uh, to make it kind of feel fuller. And that's all right. It's, uh, it's a pretty solid uh, finish on this beer for, for what it is. And um, kind of leaves you feeling refreshed, feeling like you want to take it on the sip, that sort of thing. Um, and it's a, it's a good body for a American pale ale. It's not too sweet, it's not too thick. It kind of gives you like a very high drinkability in the beer, which is great to see. And then now we're gonna go in for flavor. Mm. So this might be about the upper echelon of what is considered an American pale ale versus an American IPA. This is a delicious beer, first of all. It is a very decently balanced beer. I wouldn't say well balanced. It's definitely a lot hoppier than I think I was intending it to be, um, but it also finished drier than I anticipated that it would. Um, and that has kind of an effect on the way that the balance of the beer actually works out. Um, but first of all, let's talk about what it actually tastes like. Yes, it is a bit more hoppy, but you could still taste the malt in general, uh, and it does have a nice, pleasant note to it. Um, I've never used Pilsner as a base malt in a hoppy beer before, and it actually turned out to be pretty good. Um, so I'm getting kind of like the classic crackery, white bready kind of Pilsner thing. Uh, and then the Munich on top of that adds a nice kind of toastiness, uh, just a very subtle amount of it. And, you know, obviously a little bit of color as well. Now it has kind of also that little bit of like a cereal type note, um, which is pretty good. So overall the, the, the malt flavor on this is is noticeable, um, it's nuanced, it's not my favorite, and it's not really exactly the way that the Moat Mountain example tastes. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute, because I'm gonna do an actual comparison side by side later on in this video. Just as it was with the aroma, you kinda get a lot more of that dankness, um, but this is a classic West Coast hop uh, profile here. Pretty much the big three are kinda like a musty dankness, some resin notes, as well as a pretty solid grapefruitiness. However, it's a little bit more fruity, a little bit more, I guess, mild on the grapefruitiness uh, than I had expected. That being said, the bitterness on this is very clean. It's very controlled. It's not overboard. The only reason why this beer tastes a little bit hoppier than it was intended is because it finished a bit drier, but I didn't add too many hops. And the other thing that I'm really happy to report here is that there's not too much grassiness. Um, it's a just a tiny bit of it. <laughs> it is there. I did dry hop with a lot of plant material, but it is not in a quantity uh, that is distracting or takes away from the beer. Um, and it blends really well into that dankness. So I think it kind of hides that a little bit. But the overall flavor is pretty much dominated by just those three things, dankness, resin, and, um, and grapefruit. This has a very distinct two-stage flavor profile where first it's just mild bitterness and then all those hop descriptors. And then it switches right over into a equally satisfying malt uh, profile. And then because it's so dry, it doesn't really stick around forever and you have to take another sip, but it's a very refreshing beer. Um, and nothing is really overboard in this beer. It's just kind of at like that, that top echelon of what I would consider to be acceptable for it. As usual, the 10% wheat that I added didn't really make that big of a difference in the flavor department, but it did add pretty substantial head retention and, um, and kind of like that, that pillowy effect. Uh, it's nice. I like doing that in most of my beers now. So overall, this is actually a pretty solid beer, pretty pretty enjoyable uh, American Pale Ale, and um, kind of ends up being a little bit on the hoppier end of the spectrum, but I definitely enjoyed making it, and I think it's a pretty solid beer. So now, let's stick around, and before I talk about what we could do to make this beer better, let's talk about how it stacks up to the actual beer I was trying to clone. So here, I have an Iron Mike Pale Ale. I think I'm gonna go ahead and top this one off so we can get a true comparison. So 
So we have my beer here on the left and the beer I was trying to clone here on the right. And it's, and I think they're damn near identical when it comes to appearance, um, which is awesome. So definitely the right ratio of Munich malt to other malts in there. Um, I can tell you mine smells a lot more dank than theirs does. This is a little bit sweeter smelling. So you get a lot more malt out of this aroma than this one, which is interesting. All right. Theirs is also fuller bodied than mine is. All right. Now for where it counts. One thing that's very noticeable here, um, this beer is sweeter. This beer is much sweeter than mine is. Um, uh, and I'm gonna chalk that up to just finishing less dry. I would say the cereal malt character is probably the most prominent in this beer right now. Um, in addition to kind of just uh, less bitterness. That tells me that I probably ended up either mashing too low or adjusting my water profile such that I had too high of a sulfate to chloride ratio uh, because this beer here is a lot sweeter, a lot maltier, a lot rounder, a lot fuller body, which tells me that the water profile is probably a lot more along the lines of something with more chlorides in it than sulfates and uh, that sort of thing. Um, this is not what I did for this one. And when it comes down to it, this tastes a lot more classically West Coast than this does. I'm not getting nearly as much uh, general hoppiness out of the Iron Mike. <coughs> And I think that might have something to do with probably the way that I added my hops, because I just added even amounts of all three of them at every point. And uh, they might have switched that up. And as a result, they probably don't have as much like overall dankness. That being said, theirs really does come in a lot more along the lines of what is a real pale ale in terms of a really balanced beer. And I mean, if I really had to pick one of these two, I really, it would be a difficult choice because this one's hoppier, this one's more aggressive, it's more interesting in terms of the hops, and this one's more balanced, it's sweeter, it's a little, little bit fuller, it's not as easy to drink, uh, but it has a little bit more of that malt complexity. So it's all up to you, what do you want to drink? So now we'll talk about what I could have done to improve this beer a little bit. Uh, first and foremost, I think I probably would have mashed at a higher temperature to kind of preserve some of those sugars so that they stick around for a bit longer and we have a higher finishing gravity. That would not only bring my alcohol level down to the 5.6 that I was targeting for this beer here, but also it would have given me a little bit more balance and sweetness in the final product. At the same time, I probably would have also changed the water profile to be either more of a balanced profile or more of a malt forward profile. What that means is just increasing the amount of chlorides relative to the amount of sulfates um, instead of the other way around, which is what I did for this one. Other than that, I'm very happy with the product that I made. It is a great pale ale and will continue to, uh, to make people happy over the next couple weeks that it's in the keg. Anyway, thanks for watching the video, guys. I do appreciate it. And let me know down below if you have any thoughts or comments or questions or concerns, whatever, on the beer. I do read them all, and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can. I would appreciate it if you dropped a like for the video and also subscribed if you want more content like this. I am doing my best to upload every single Friday morning now. Um, we'll see how long that lasts, but I'm going to keep it up as long as I can. If that's not enough content for you, I do have an Instagram that's at the apartment brewer on Instagram. And I also have a Patreon, which, uh, normally I link up in the corner, but that's broken right now. So it's in the description box down below. And if you're interested in brewing this beer, the recipe for what I did is down in the description box should be adjustable for any other all in one system, just like the claw hammer. So like you can use it for a robo brew or a grain father or a anvil foundry, mash and boil, whatever you have. Uh, little adjustment should be fine. If you like what you see with the claw hammer supply system, there's a link down in the description where you can purchase that as well, along with a bunch of other links to Amazon for a lot of my preferred gear and uh, things that I think make home brewing a bit more easy and fun. So check those out as well if you're in the market for it. It's another great way to support this channel. Anyway, I'll catch you guys in the next one. So until then, double cheers.